Welcome to Unrestrained, the podcast series from CPI. Here you can enjoy conversations where professionals on all sides of crisis and behavior management relax and open up about themselves, their workplace, and their clients. You'll get the latest tips and trends from the best in the business, so tune in often to integrate their experiences with your own. Hello and welcome to Unrestrained, the CPI podcast series. This is your host, Terry Vitone, and today I have the pleasure of talking to John Heiderscheidt. He is the Director of Safety and Culture at School District U46 in Elgin, Illinois. Hello and welcome, John. Hello, Terry. Uh, John Heiderscheidt currently serves as the Director of School Safety and Culture for School District U46, headquartered in Elgin, Illinois. His purpose is to facilitate, promote, and help maintain a safe, secure, and nurturing school learning environment that is flexible in meeting the academic, social, and emotional needs of each student. John is a retired police officer and serves as a juvenile officer and school resource officer. John has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in law enforcement and justice administration. He is a master level certified instructor for the Crisis Prevention Institute. John, my first question is about a recent news item that I saw about how your district has been able to cut out of school suspensions by 74% in the last eight years. Now, those are some really dramatic results, and I, I think it'll be a good lead into our interview to understand how your personal philosophy and the school's policy uh, regarding suspension has led to such dramatic and positive outcomes. Yeah, um, and thanks for the, uh, recognizing the work, and it's been an incredible amount of work. To give some frame of reference for the audience, uh, we have five high schools, eight middle schools, and 40 elementary schools. Wow. The uh, the, the student population is about 41,000 students, mm-hmm. and we're in the suburban area of Chicago on the far western edge of the suburbs. Our community is um, made up of 10 different, uh, our school community is made up of 10 different municipalities. The reason why I'm giving that frame is um, the city of Elgin um, is a city of just over 100,000 people and the other communities surround that small city. So we do have some urban as well as suburban as well as some um, you know, uh, I guess you would say upper middle class areas. Uh, so we kind of get everything from one end of the spectrum of socioeconomic status to the other. Just for maybe people who aren't familiar with the geography of Illinois, to drive from Elgin to Chicago proper would take? Uh, depending on what time you drive. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but usually you're talking about, uh, we're about 25 to 27 miles um, west okay. of downtown Chicago. All right, great. So in in uh, I started in 2006, which is a little over nine years ago. What we were seeing and experiencing um, in our communities uh, was a high level of fights in our high schools, um, all five high schools, even in our middle schools. There was a there was an awful lot of physical aggression and fights happening um, on our streets. We were being riddled with gang incidents that were happening in our community. Those gang incidents were, uh, did include some very, very tragic um, deaths, and those deaths included our students, and the um, and these were happening on the streets, and those uh, those people that were causing that to happen were also our students. Hmm. That has to really influence culture inside the school. It, it certainly does, and you know any type of um, school culture is not mutually exclusive of the community. Right. Um, what happens to a kid in on the yeah and at home on the streets and in school is is the same experience. Mm-hmm. So, um, so you, moving forward, so you come into basically a very uh, just a culture of where violence could erupt pretty much at any moment and and might be expected to. Yeah, and was um, that same first year, uh, just a few months after I started here, we had a teacher that was attacked in a classroom. Mm-hmm by a student who had a, brought a knife to school. So you're, you're exactly right on. Um, so these things were happening. So starting to look at data, starting to look what was going on, starting to look at our expulsion rates, starting to look at how many kids were being arrested in schools, and uh, finding out that um, we didn't have any real systems or process, we started looking at a uh, hard look at what was happening. That's what really led us to CPI in managing our fights in our schools and finding a different way to de-escalate behavior. I see. So, so we were finding that we were expelling uh, 22 kids, 
22 to 25 kids on average each school year for what was called um, or classified as staff assaults. So you mean your, look, your, your administration and yourself personally were so shocked by the level of violence that you said we have to find some, some way to redress this culture? Well, I can say, um, so I was a new guy. Okay. And I'm not trying to say this is about anything about what I, what I view or what I think of, but as thinking as a police officer uh-huh. and, you know, as, you know, coming from that uh, different environment, different suburban area, um, and coming here, that it was almost that the culture had led to being, uh, this is just the way it happens. It's always happened that way. It's, we've always done it this way. You know, it was one of those cultures of, this is our tradition, this is who we are. I see. In, in other words, if there is violent altercation that involves a st- staff and a student, this is, this is our policy right here and we're not going to deviate from it. Right. Let's suspend them five days out of school. That'll change them. Let's put them out 10 days. Let's put those out of school suspensions. And, you know, so the philosophy of that is where are we putting the kids? Mm -hmm. Right. We're putting them on the streets. Hmm. And when you put more kids on the streets and you put more kids on the streets, what you're really doing is allowing them more opportunity to get involved with gangs, get involved with drugs, get pregnant, get whatever. Mm -hmm. Is you know, so out of school suspensions was built on a model of, you know, uh, a time in life when 30 years ago we may have had parents at home during the school day. Mm-hmm. Right. We don't have that anymore. Mm-hmm. So it's it's really an effort to um, really look at it from a different perspective. Are there ways we can do business differently, and how do you n- start nudging a system to start looking at it differently? Mm-hmm. So um, go back to the expulsion, you know, 22 kids a year, we were expelling about 40 kids a year. That may sound like a small number, but it's actually pretty traumatic. Oh, it sounds like a lot. I mean, for, just that, on the expulsion track, 40 students is, that's a lot. That's, that's 40 families, mm-hmm. you know, and then you start looking at kind of where they live and that's concentrated in certain areas. That's, that means something. So these exclusionary measures, this exclusionary process of discipline to try to change behavior simply doesn't work. Um, and, and really simply put, it's, it's, it's a pathway. Uh, you may have heard of the school to prison pipeline. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and the research tells us that, you know, it's, yes, it, it could be a correlational if not causistic. No, the kind of skills that a student's going to learn on the street when they're not in school are the kind of skills that are going to eventually, when they're caught, lead them to a penitentiary, I would expect, right? I mean, that's the... Well, and that's, yeah, because the legal system's going to get involved. Right, right. Um, so using CPI, I don't know if you want to talk about that yet, but um, sure. what we used, so we looked at our staff assaults and what our staff assaults essentially were, we're, um, we were jumping in the middle of fights to break them up. That had to lead to a lot of staff injuries and a lot of staff missing days as well. A lot of staff injuries, a lot of staff missing days, um, more workman's comp claims, more of all those things. But more importantly, what do kids see? The, when staff intervenes in a fight, what kids see is actually staff fighting with kids. You know, when we're just jumping in the middle by ourselves, we're intervening alone we're just jumping in the middle of a, a what are you, your really only course is to start wrestling people away from each other. And, you know, violence begets violence, I think, anyway. Right, right. Uh, that hands-on, uh, I mean, v- very rarely leads to uh, the sort of uh, reduction in violence that you hope it will. And, and the language, and, and so I, I must say this, because I think it's really important, and if you're and from, from, the, from the school perspective, is... Anybody that works in a school, by law and by board policy, must get involved in discipline situations. Mm-hmm. You don't have a choice. You must intervene. I see. And, and so when I asked the question, I said, well, if we must intervene and we must, what's the training? What, how are we telling people to do this? And our staff are doing exactly what we told them to do. Mm-hmm. Stop the fight as fast as possible. So how do you start introducing the concept of a nonviolent intervention into uh, Elgin, the district that you work in? So our first, our first nudge in was with our, um, hall, uh, our hallway supervisors. We call them dean's assistants here, okay. and our secondary administrators. And so back in 2009, um, really, really walked into this as a strategy on how to de-escalate a situation and how to manage a fight. 
Were you aware of these techniques from your career in law enforcement at all? In the area of that is when I worked in I worked in a village uh, called Buffalo Grove with um, so it's a northern suburb of Chicago northwestern and um, in the school districts I worked when I was a school resource officer and uh, and a juvenile officer I was aware that those school districts any person who was a special ed uh, teacher or assistant teacher they were required to go to this training every year. And uh, and asking more questions, that's that's the CPI training. So our school districts up in that area that I worked with there, their their special ed folks, right, were trained every year. And uh, so I had some knowledge. And then the, there were some people I worked with here that also had knowledge of CPI. And uh, and so I researched the company, looked at the model, and you know, and I really believe that the model has a as a as a police officer at the time, I believe it had. Um, a real good um, connection to even a use of force model for a police officer. How so? Well, so um, we had a training called Verbo Judo, okay. you know, which, that. yeah, and even that by itself would suggest that it's all about the fight, mm-hmm. you know, Verbo Judo. Ver- and, and, it's, and so I, I look back at CPI now and the training that I've had, you know, from the global professionals that I've taken from, I really wish I would have had that training as a police officer when I was 21. Mm, I see. You look at things differently. You can say things that, you know, make a difference, your tone, volume, cadence, all the things that we know as CIs, um, you know, really that make a significant difference um, and pull it all back to the coping strategy. You very unlikely you'll need to use restraints. So sort of a shift in orientation in how you see what you previously would have seen as as the subject of your interest as a police officer to a more supportive and directive sort of uh, uh, orientation just at the very outset of uh, initial interaction with the individual. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's valuable. I think uh, when I took the training, I certainly came away with that after four days, and uh, I was just amazed at my reorientation uh, towards uh, just conflict and interaction in general. Yeah, and 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 um, and so just based on the question too, the first question: How do we also reduce this by um, this significant number? We've we've done it slowly and methodically, but we haven't done it alone. Um, it's been with our community partners. We've had um, agencies around us, social uh, service agencies, uh, youth agencies, um, and there's a couple reasons why I'm saying this. They've been integral in helping kids, small circles, alternative to school suspension programs, um, working in the area of actually bringing them to our suspension rooms with with our in-school suspension and doing training and pro-social behavior for kids and and choices and decision-making. So I see. So rather than this model of an out-of-school suspension that had at its at its at its core maybe this old uh, outmoded uh, idea of the family with a caregiver that would be there for the child all day, which isn't the case anymore. You guys looked at that and said, let's bring the the, the suspension into school. And when we put you into the suspension room, there are going to be some rules that are going to make you productive there, essentially. At least some form of training. Okay. And, and, you know, what does the word discipline mean or what's the definition? And and so I, and this is, I, I try to talk to folks. This is hard for folks to make this paradigm shift, but discipline doesn't mean to punish. Discipline means to teach or, or to mentor or to bring along. And, and if we look at it in a different way, and um, the, the difficult work is helping people with a paradigm shift. I see. And you found CPI training was a was a good method to get that paradigm shift to occur. Not just a good. I I, I thought it. So so I can say anything I want working in an agency and kind of stand over in a corner and dangle and make noise. And um, but when I have a professional organization that has a evidence based practices that's worldwide training. Now, that really brings substance to um, to what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Right. So, when did uh, when did you guys start training? So, it's 2009 is when I became an instructor. Um, we had another instructor here uh, uh, that had a previous experience from other school districts. We started initially training 
And then um, we we were lucky enough to have what was called the REMS grant back in the day. Okay. And it was a readiness and emergency management for schools. So um, we, we were able to get 35 instructors trained um, in that same year. So we, we – go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. No, I'm, please tell your story. So, so you Yeah, so we – we pushed out training, um, probably not didn't do it the organized and best way to do it. We just started pushing towards it. Um, so since then, uh, we went from a small amount of people trained, and today sitting where we are right now, I'm down to 16, or I'm sorry, down to 15 certified instructors for the district. Mm-hmm. We have probably 10, you know, five to 10 days of training per year where, where people can sign up. Nothing's required. But people can sign up for training, and uh, right now I can tell you that forty-eight uh, percent, if almost fifty percent, of our staff have touched CPI training in the last three or four years. That's great. That's great. That's great. And and this has contributed to this this remarkable drop in out of school suspensions, and seventy-four percent in eight years. That's. Would you say that those two are pretty closely linked? I think there's a link. There's other things, obviously. Um, you know, there's PBIS. Um, that's a, a significant link for us. That we're working really hard on community partners. But this 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 substance of CPI, um, I believe, and I hope hopefully others um, understand this, that that's your your pra- that's your practice. You know, this is your template. Mm-hmm. And all these other agencies and people will have different things they can bring to it, right. but you have your core mm-hmm. of how we approach situations when they happen, how we view escalations and agitations, and how we how we how we move into those situations. I see, I see. But I, according to the article too, though, a lot of the reasons that this drop has been so precipitous in eight years is because of. Uh, because of the rooms, the day rooms that in school that the people in suspension come into. I mean, they're they're not allowed to put their head down. They're not allowed, I believe, and it's in the article to to have any kind of a mobile device whatsoever. I mean, it's almost like they're encouraged to to use the space and the time to actually do their schoolwork, and it, it is seen as is a chance, not as you said, as a discipline, not as a punishment per se, but it's more as an opportunity for them to have a quiet space to kind of get back on track with their studies. Yeah, that's. That's what we're working towards. And, and so when we talk about Streamwood High School in that article, that's our one school that I believe is doing it the best. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're not perfect in all places. Right. But that's also the one school that in that area has the most community resources that have really embedded them. Um, so this place called, not to advertise, I'm not doing that, but it's a Hanover Township Youth and Family Services. Mm-hmm. What their director did is brought their staff and – we train them because we're in a contract basis with them um, to bring them into our schools, but we've trained them in CPI. That's so what what they said is that, hey, we want to be on the same page with what you're doing. Streamwood High School is our only high school that all staff members, gen ed, special ed, um, teacher's assistants, uh, people working in the hallways are trained in CPI. I see. And are you moving it so, towards that as a goal for the other schools in the district? Yeah, the, definitely. I mean, the, the model is working. Mm-hmm. Um, when we, we look at, um, so to give you a comparison, Streamwood High School four years ago had more fights, had uh, probably more gang issues, but definitely more fights because that's a tangible number I can put to it mm-hmm. than any of our other high schools with more kids in the other places. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's and a cultural more, thing at work there for sure. Yeah, and so they had more fights by percentage. Hmm. And how you measure that is you measure that by saying, okay, you have this many fights um, or occurrences of out-of-school suspension for fights, and you have this much population, and you just get a rate, you know, a basic you know, percentage. I see. So Streamwood High School four years ago had the most fights, had the most problems, had the, you know, they were there, and over three years after they trained them in CPI, they, after they did um, the, the training in CPI, um, the dean's assistants there, the, the core of five, really embraced CPI practices when they're everyday workings with kids. You know, mm-hmm. I, and, 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 and the principal was fully embedded in the leadership of that, and so was the administrative team. We had staff there that weren't interested. Mm. That, that sometimes can happen. 
Yeah, but but ultimately this school embraced it and moved forward with it, and today they have the least amount of fights. That's well. That says a lot for the effectiveness of the training, and and how much the the, the administrators and the and the deans for, have embraced it. That's a good su success story. Um, I've heard there's a new law, Illinois law, coming into effect this September that's going to require school districts to further reduce their use of punitive and exclusionary disciplinary measures unless a student poses a threat to the school's safety. Has it been a long time coming? Um, and what's the feeling of, uh, among the staff about this? Do you see hope uh, in, in this kind of a thing in legislative activity? A absolutely. Um, the, the law came from a group of students in Chicago. Um, they had their own um, uh, coalition, if you will, and they were trying to approach legislature, legis legislators about these five-day, ten-day, put kids on the streets, put kid in, kids on the streets. And I'm speaking from my terms. I'm not speaking for them. Um, but that's what I read out of the uh, intent of the law, if you will. Mm -hmm. And in Illinois, we have districts, school districts doing much different things in different places. So about three or four years ago, we saw that the law was um, waiting and it was proposed and it's gone through some revisions. We needed to prepare ourselves for that because really what it says is to reduce, you know, you said it very, very clearly, but it, it is to reduce the exclusionary measures to keep kids in school. Do you know the name of that bill by any chance? It's, uh, we, we refer to it as Public Act 456. Public Act 456. Okay, good. That'll be good to include in, in uh, the data that we include with the written stuff with the podcast so people can look it up and maybe advocate for it uh, as it uh, goes through the process. One of your quotes regarding CPI training says, CPI improved staff de-escalation skills, improved overall safety, and has become ingrained in our training. Can you speak about, I know because you're uh, involved in culture there so much, John, can you talk about how and why CPI has become ingrained in certain U46 schools? Why has it made such an impact? So it's um, the ingrained piece. So I have a, a unique opportunity to have about 45 minutes a year where I go to each school and at a staff meeting have what is called safety training. Mm -hmm. So in the safety training, I have learned um, over the years that staff really doesn't, generally speaking, and this is in, the, this is in research too with school safety, they really don't have any way to manage these situations. You know, people don't, the colleges don't have this in their curriculum. People, people basically manage discipline or agitated or escalated students the way they were probably managed in their homes. Right, right. There isn't any formalized curriculum in the college that, or when they come into school, uh, that addresses that. And, and, and so I, I learned over time, that I refer to this as managing it by accident. Okay. You know, it's right. it's it's it, we have so many different staff members from so many different perspectives and family environments and situ. They're all doing it differently, mm -hmm. which like is that. not good. No, I mean it's it, it's managing by accident. I mean it, by accident rather it is uh, it has a, an ironic ring to it, but there's certainly nothing funny about managing that kind of behavior in an accidental and not a deliberative way. So and and so uh, nice, nicely done. Um, so when when I looked at it, I, the safety training that I'm having, I focused mostly on lockdown and what the police do and what fire departments do and all those kinds of things. And I I learned as we started training in CPI that I I have these 45 minutes. I could use a scenario of a frustrated student and a student that you know, is in a rage and yelling and says, I hate you, get away from me, and I'm going to hurt somebody, leave me alone. And then use that scenario to have staff do, you know, like think, pair, share, and in a very quick amount of time, have them have their own discussion about the way they would manage it, have them report out, and then have a group discussion on evidence-based practices on how to manage it, which is CPI. Right. And so what I what I've what I've uh, um, changed my training to is really all scenario based situations. How you know a fight's happening? What do you do? Have people think about it. Have people talk to their colleagues without saying it out loud, mm -hmm. and then have a group discussion 
And then what I've done is I, then I take all of CPI and put it on the board and, you know, put it on a pro- PowerPoint presentation. And here's here, first you use proximics, posture, um, you know, um, then use your CPI supportive stance, clear the audience. We, I actually am to the point after about three or four years now of staffs repeating this back to me, you know, repeating this back to us in, in these trainings. And then the colleagues are hearing colleagues are hearing colleagues say the same things. And that would be a good example of it becoming ingrained in, in the in the schools when people start repeating the terminology back during the training and to other people, then they're internalizing it to the point where it can become very useful in, in the moment. And, and and so in ingraining it is, you know, leadership believes in it, right? You got to have the belief from the top. Um, and you can sprinkle it into places where people can see, okay, there's a use, they'll get introduced to it. And then after three or four years, they just, then they start repeating it back to you. Then they attend this thing called the CPI full day training, and then they're hearing the same things again. Mm-hmm. You know, and, it, and you just and you got to find those ways in your organization to keep repeating it and replicating it, keep repeating it and replicating it. Right. What Not to say we're perfect. We're right. still riddled with with issues, but we're sure. we're getting better. Mm-hmm. You you've said that CPI training has led to improved student outcomes because of. Increase in direct instruction time, for instance, test scores, student grades, graduation rates. Can you talk about how CPI training is linked to these outcomes? So, well, number one, keeping kids in school. Right. Right. You have uh, you have more opportunity, um, more opportunity for kids to learn. Those 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 um, those are very important strategies. The second one is, is if we can reduce the amount of times kids create behavior infractions. Um, that's one thing. But behavior infractions, some research that I've seen, are linked to staff um, feeling of unsafety. Mm. And and when you think about it in this regard, and no matter what setting you are in, hospital, uh, uh, mental health um, facility, whatever that might be, the research says that if we feel unsafe as staff members, we're going to tend to have clients that are going to be involved in more behavior stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, and so if I can improve staff, staff confidence in those situations, you know, we'll not only be able to manage those situations better, but I would believe, I don't have any evidence to this, I would believe that, you know, staff would have a better confidence level of dealing with those situations. I would, yeah, would, that would, I mean, certainly is intuitive to believe that that training would provide confidence that one would know how to de-escalate a situation successfully and stand a much better chance, uh, you know, look at the decision-making matrix as part of our enhanced program that says, you know, here's, I mean, what are my best chances of, of us both going home safe today? I mean, mm-hmm. that's the kind of uh, decision that, I mean, that breeds a sort of confidence. I mean, if you if your outcomes start to, what percentage of staff at U46 has been through uh, NCI training? So when we, so it's, a, it's a difficult number to keep tracking because in our organization, we have a bit of a turnover rate. So, and then some of them, when they, when they turn over, they come back. But the best we've done in um, making sure we sort out those who've left us and keep a maintain a, uh, a chart of, um, those in the organization, long answer, short question, right? Mm-hmm. Um, is okay. we're we're at what we're at forty eight percent as of last month of all employees that have touched CPI training in the last three years. That's that's pretty good, and 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 for such a large staff, especially. I mean, uh, what was the number again? How big are you guys? So we're a staff of about five thousand employees. 5, yeah, so that's that's pretty good. And you report in the first year of CPI impl- implementation that you, you that assaults on staff dropped by as much as ninety percent because of a specific strategy about how to break up fights. Um, yes. What is that strategy, and how? I mean, that's a remarkable outcome. So, and it was with the deans and the uh, the, the uh, administrators at the secondary schools. This was our first wave into this. Um, when we did the body of research on why we're expelling kids, and we found that most times it was well those. 22 times were because we're jumping in the middle of fights and trying to break them up by taking them down. And those were actually the words our staff would say. Mm, right. And I'm not being critical. I, I'm not being critical of anybody. I'm saying those were the actual words we said. We hear it a lot. And, and, and because that's what, 
when you don't train your staff on how to do it, you're doing it by accident. Right. So that's the words they use mm-hmm. uh, and the thinking. So when we said, here's the strategy, here's CPI, here's what you can do differently, here's the strategy for breaking up fights, call for help first, wait for your help, don't intervene alone. Right. That was the change. And so just by those those simple steps, you dropped uh, assaults on staff because largely they knew to follow the, those that protocol before they jumped in and physically put hands on anyone. Right. And, and, and mind you, if you're working with a school district that's a large school district or small, sometimes staff to make that change isn't a fun, great thing. Speak to so that. I'm not So I'm not suggesting that people embrace that change. Mm-hmm. In, in other words, there is resist. There's there's a cultural and organizational resistance to, uh, you know, uh, I'm, we've heard this sometimes from other uh, officers of uh, pre, prior, prior police officers who come in and say, you know, sometimes we meet resistance. You know, this lovey dovey stuff is not going to be effective, but once people start to realize that they are safe for themselves and that it does work that it, it, there's almost a, a, an aha moment that you see among staff that can almost be a, a contagious in a good way. Yeah, and, and that first year was not that aha moment. I see. <laughs> Maybe for some. Mm-hmm. Um, but so we still occasionally have, and, and we're people, and it's, right. and it's a people business. So occasionally, once in a while, we'll still have, you know, and, and fortunately or unfortunately, kids videotape everything. Right. So, you know, once in a while we'll see a staff member that's jumping in the middle of a fight. Mm-hmm. It's important that we we don't criticize. It's important that we debrief with the coping strategy with our staff members the correct way. Mm-hmm. And we follow that to help improve their practice. How rigorously do you guys debrief? In schools, we're yeah. terrible at it. Is that right? We're And at least here, we're terrible at it. We're a large organization. Mm-hmm. We're, I like it, probably every other school district and every other place right now, short-staffed and mm-hmm. trying to do too much. It's it's something that we keep nudging towards and we're getting better at, but we're certainly not doing it like we should. Right. Something we did, and uh, this is uh, just a kind of a thought, as far as the coping strategy, something we did um, three years ago is any student that received an out-of-school suspension was then required to do a reentry plan. And what what would be the components of a reentry plan? The coping strategy. Uh, I see. Okay. So what we did is we created a form, and I, I think we've shared that on our Yammer um, on our accounts. When there's other people passing forms around and, and CPI, you know, uh, endorsed materials, and we use the same coping strategy. So the administrator that put the student out if you will, out of school suspended. When they come back the next day, there's a conversation, there's the coping strategy. Hey, what's your level of anxiety about this situation? One to 10, the uh, the client um, gives us that information. They work through the coping strategy to try to negotiate change and give back some some power to the situation. But that didn't come out, come without resistance either. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. So, but now, um, as of last year, it became school board policy. Oh, excellent, excellent. So, I mean, it must be, in order to be adopted as, as policy, there must be enough change in the mindset there about the effectiveness of uh, instituting the coping model as a reentry method. Yeah, and, 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 it, and, it, and it, I believe it's another contributing factor why we're reducing recidivism with out-of-school suspensions and how we're reducing it totally. In such a big district, how do you partner with local law enforcement to quell violence? So um, we have school resource officers from four different municipalities in our schools. Um, I have the the pleasure, really, of overseeing that program um, as it correlates to everything else we do in in discipline and safety. And um, so we have four different police departments, Elgin, the city of, we have seven officers, Streamwood, three, Bartlett, two, and South Elgin, the community of, we have two. They're all in our secondary schools. I see. And and some the Public Act four five six, this new law that doesn't take effect until September, and I'm trying not to brag, so please don't think it's that way. <laughs> I doubt that won't come off that way. 
but but the law comes and it says that you know you must have an agreement with your law enforcement officers if they're working in your schools. You must have um, you must have a, an MOU or a contract. You should have information sharing agreements. You should have all those things. Well, we have that in place since 2008, and wow. we up we update that on a regular basis. So you're way ahead of the the, the state mandate. Way ahead. Yeah. And and I feel like we're way behind it. I see. You know, explain. So in in Buffalo Grove, we had done those things in the nineties. Mm-hmm. You know, see. so in in two thousand six, um, starting here, we had none. Actually, we had such little communication between our police departments and uh, the school district. We had such little sharing of community events that we would have a shooting with students involved over the weekend on Saturday. And on Monday morning, we didn't have any information in the school district, nor did the school resource officer. So it's almost as if it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's like, hey, guys, it, what if we have retaliation? you got to be telling us stuff. And And what we found out is, yeah, we really didn't have anything happening. Um, and and uh, great people doing great work. There was a, really a clear realization, and they already had the realization. They had the need. Really, the school district didn't have the process for them to make it happen. I see. So we had to make it happen for them, and uh, and it it has really benefited us uh, getting a better understanding of what goes on in the community with our kids. That's great. That's great. You know, I was talking to one of our staff here, uh, Bob Ratman, about uh, that, that you had attended another CPI uh, pilot program for something called trauma-informed care, and that you were able to use the skills that you learned there to keep a student in class that you otherwise would have suspended, like in the very first week after you'd taken this this class, because you understood the student's behavior better. Can you do you remember that uh, that story? Do you remember that occasion? Not specifically the the um, the one that sticks out in my mind, um, and the story I I repeatedly tell um, after having uh, some training with our principals about trauma informed care is I focus on the small thing I focus on on the everyday is using the term from t- uh, trauma informed care that I learned from our course the beta course that was uh, was um, what's happening mm-hmm. versus what's wrong with you right right. And and one of our principals in our elementary schools, um, she uh, she she told the story of what happened. And and so you had a third grader that came back to school. Third grader had been out of school for a couple of days. We know we didn't know why. The teacher didn't know why. The family didn't share. The parents didn't share the why. And when the student came back to school, could um, the teacher visibly saw that the student was something was wrong. And within a very short amount of time, the student started. Um, being very aggressive, yelling. Kids were starting to make fun of him because he was yelling. He was picking up chairs. He was was becoming fairly, I would hate to say violent on a third grader, but his physical aggression was becoming very strong. Oh, he's Um, acting out like obviously something was deeply troubling the boy. So... So the you know the uh, the teacher called for the principal. The principal came up in the room and and um, the principal said to the to, to the young man, "Hey, what's happening? What's happening?" Mm-hmm. And called him by name. And and that I'm sure was a made him stop and and have to relate then. And what did how did he reply? So it was a melting moment for him. You know, somebody asked me, and I don't know what was going on in the, in the young man's head, but he did. The principal said he he kind of melted. She saw some tension reduction, and the young man left the room with her. Hmm. Wow, that is, dramatic. that is dramatic. So, so, and there's two points to this. Two more points to this to tell the story even more clearly. Because if she would have walked in the room and said, "Hey, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Why are you doing this?" Where do you think the boy would have ended up? Oh, and restraints and seclusion. Probably in our police department. As a third grader. As a third grader. Wow, yeah. Because so is... it would have got worse, mm-hmm. right? Right. Well, escalated, I'm sure it would have, yeah. I mean, that's provocative, what you just said. And I mean, uh, intended to, I, I mean, to rat, just like putting a nickel in the kid at that point, right? Yeah. And guess what happened? Guess what we learned? Um, <laughs> he was hungry or angry or tired or... 
even worse. So he came to school, and yes, his family lives in poverty, but where he was over those last days that he wasn't in school was attending his cousin, his favorite cousin's funeral. Because his cousin, who lived in Chicago, was shot in the back three times in gang violence and killed. So he comes in with that sort of grief and, and loss and wants to act out. Hmm. So, and, that, and that's trauma-informed care. That's acute level mm-hmm. two, if not level three, right. um, level of trauma. And the simple phrases of, hey, what's happening? Um, help that young man, right, mm-hmm. de-escalate with someone who, I don't know that the res- the relationship between the principal and that young man was that strong, but certainly her actions mm-hmm. de-escalated the situation almost instantly. That's great. And I mean, her willingness, I mean, to ask a question and wait for an answer, I mean, just like, I mean, you, it almost seems like a basic thing, like what's, what's wrong or what's, 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 what's happening is a much more, you know, a, a smoother way. I mean, there's, there's, there's so many, it doesn't put someone on the spot so much as give them the latitude to answer as they will, but at least to be heard. At least to be heard. Yeah. Yeah. Beyond uh, our core curriculum of nonviolent crisis infra- infra- training and, uh, and, and trauma-informed care, have you guys used any other advanced courses? So I've attended the uh, verbal escalation skills, or uh, what, what's that course? Uh, enhanced verbal intervention. Enhanced verbal skills. Enhanced verbal skills. Mm-hmm. Um, found it very useful because I apply it in very short, you know, in my uh, annual safety training. Mm-hmm. In terms of there's a couple real good things that you can show people that help them understand and, you know, how you communicate with people. And um, that's been very helpful. Um, I use the I use bits of the trauma informed care piece during that training to, you know, just kind of keep embedding it somehow, some way. Um, anytime I have contact with people. Let me see. Now, with the, with with a staff of five thousand and forty eight percent trained, how often do you guys provide refresher training? So we provide in the we, last year our school district moved to. Um, professional development days as a district and then as professionals. So the difference is is that uh, the district has days where we can ask people to come to training. I see. And on, and on the professional days, teachers can really elect to do something with their teams, with their groups, go attend something. And so there's 10 days per year where I have um, that opportunity. So I know that's probably something that I don't know if that makes sense to other organizations, but um, what we've done with CPI and the 15 instructors that we have, we are we schedule training, and so people can attend whatever, whenever, and however they wish. So the be very direct with the question. We don't track our refreshers very well. I see, but it's but certainly but certainly staff knows that that is available to them uh, if they'd like to make the time to attend it. Yes. All right. Yeah. And next year, what we're doing is we're going to move all of our refreshers to the bullying behaviors model. I see. And and that's just why, because you think you're going to get more results out of that, that focus? And then, in, in, uh, uh, yes, absolutely. And the focus, so I've learned over years that um, bullying is a significant thing. Bullying does lead to the retribution thinking of people and it it has a connection to violence, mm-hmm. um, a strong connection, and it even has a strong connection to the retribution thinking of an, an offender that's done this kind of damage and terrible things. Mm-hmm. So what I found in the bullying behaviors um, refresher is that it just, it, it not just, it gives adults an understanding of what the behavior looks like mm-hmm. for the bullying, the target, and the bystander. Right. And then intervention steps. What I have found is that we have this expectation that every staff member should know what to do, and they don't. And and if we Mm -hmm. go ahead, I'm sorry. I wonder where you think that expectation comes from. I mean, it seems like how would you know the you know the best way to uh, intervene in a bullying situation unless you had curriculum and and some best practice information about that. Well, you're a teacher, aren't you? Aren't you supposed to know everything? Yes, right, right. I mean, um, I guess it's good that we're drilling down more into what the what what is necessary as a teacher these days, and 
and so certainly we see these in things like SEL programs and in understanding bullying and so forth. So, I mean, it, as an evolution of what a teacher's role is and what expertise is needed, it's a positive thing, I think. Yeah, yeah I, I think so. You're a police officer. Aren't you supposed to know that? Hey, Terry, you work right. for CPI. Don't you know that? Right, right. And it becomes a social thing that, no, it's not really there. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, how could, I know you've uh, so you've been working with us a while. Um, it'd be great if you could describe how and why you access our instructor services and how that support has affected your ability to teach the program and any operational impact it might have had on your organization. Sure. Um, been uh, over the years with Milwaukee being close to my location. I've had the, the a great I've had a great experience. Anytime I call CPI, I, I get excellent service. Um, anything I want, <laughs> you know, I get within reason, of course. Um, and it's been, and it's been extremely helpful. Uh, uh folks like Randy, uh, Boardman and, um, others have come down and they've audited our classes. They've audited, um, my classes and, and it and really has improved my teaching. I see. Um, and, uh, it's actually improved, um, our resources. We had, uh, and I, I forgot his name terribly. He's actually involved with the school um, up in CPI. He's involved with the school uh, um, programs. But he came down and audited a full day, and we he was listening as we were talking to teachers about setting limits and how to do that. And he him felt that we had conversations of, hey, we could use more tools. And the next year at conference last year, they passed out a tool that was um, – you know, setting limits, how to, how staff can avoid power struggles. Was that Jeff Schill by any chance? Yes, yeah. yes, sorry. Okay. And, and now it's, I use this form in every training that I do. Oh, that's great. You know, and advocating that, you know, hey, staff, just take a look at one of these things. And if it, if it, one of them works, it, it might work for you and make your day just a little bit better and the student's day might a little bit better. Um, I, I started uh, sponsoring classes here at U46 where other people can come. Um, usually that's in June. The, your, your staff sets all that up, makes all that happen. The, uh, the, the resources and videos are improving, improving, improving. It, it makes training a lot easier for, for us to manage that and, uh, with our 15 CIs. Great. It's just it's just been endless. I you you truly are what you say you are as far as being CPI and being helpful to other people. Thank you, thank you very much. How would you recommend other school administrators, someone in your position, for instance, would go about seeking funding for behavioral intervention training, as when they talk to their budgetary decision makers? I mean, uh, I mean, it's been suggested that one of the things you do is that you so you go out and seek press, and you get press, and then you take that in front of your board and say. Here's why we need to keep doing this. Yeah, it's, it's kind of not that, it's not quite that tricky, because um, uh, <laughs> okay. that feels like it was tricky. Right. <laughs> um, what, what um, the way, the first thing I would do is if, uh, if there was a fellow administrator out there that wanted some ideas, I would suggest you first look at your data. Okay, great. L mm -hmm. Look at your expulsions, look at your out-of-school suspensions, find out from people where your pain spots are, and start small. No, that's good advice. Yeah, I don't know that I would go 35 instructors in the first throw because I think we did it. I did it poorly, and I wasn't able to manage the magnitude of what I was getting myself into. I see. So you, how, what, what, what would you now that you look back on it? What would you, do you think you would optimally start with? I, you know, for my size, I would have started with five fellow instructors. Mm -hmm. I would have worked every month with them and met with them on a more frequent basis to support them. Um, and support their training to be more consistent, and then, you know, so it dep everything's size and scale. Mm -hmm. But you got to know what you're going after. Right. Good point. You good know, because if you don't, then you're just saying it's a good idea to be a good idea, and that's not true. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking, right. It's, that leads to my next question. I mean, uh, something just to be a good idea. So, what would you say, rather than something being that, what are some of the most lasting differences at CPI training has made in the lives there for your staff and students? I mean, what's really stuck? since you brought it in? I, I believe that staff has an understanding that whatever I do at this point is going to escalate or de-escalate the situation. Uh, I see a mindfulness in the moment that they are uh, in a... Uh, why am I forgetting this? I'm going to have to edit this because I should, should come right there. In, in, they're in an integrated experience. 
And that, yes. And that, that is one of the key self-awarenesses that this training brings. And, and one of the things I focus on um, in, in all – so if, if you're moving towards this, you need to have like – a sprinkle of safety training for all staff that you can do in a half an hour to 45 minutes I that see. embeds. This has really been successful for me because when I started doing this more and more, I can't keep up with the amount of people that want CPI training now. Is that right? Yeah. So I, are actually I, seeking it out. Yeah. I don't have enough structures for Tuesday. You know, we have um, 60 to 70 people signed up and I have three instructors. I'd like to keep the classes at 20. Wow, and is, that, is it is it an enthusiasm to get trained because of people talking up the program at in in the district? You know, I don't I don't know. Okay. Uh, I don't know the answer to that directly, um, but I would say that more and more people are looking for strategies on how to manage, and I believe it's in the best advertisement is word of mouth. Absolutely, I mean, there's nothing okay. like testimony from a peer to to sway you. Hey, this helped me. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I would say if, if, an, if you're thinking about doing this, nudge it, nudge it slowly. Um, get leadership support before you even start doing that by saying, here's our pain spots. Mm -hmm. This is why we need to do this. We're expelling kids for this, or we have these out-of-school suspensions, or we're reporting this many fights here. Mm -hmm. Because then if you get administrative support to do it small and you can show results, that's going to lead to something else. Excellent. Excellent. That, uh... Now, it. When you mentioned the media thing, I just want to touch on that back a little bit. So part of part of I, I'm very media friendly. I I enjoy that um, being the uh, point person for safety and and talking to the media. I believe the media is our friend, mm -hmm. um, and I believe they want to tell the story. So it kind of did this accidentally, but the media were interested in how we possibly make school safer and how we do those things. So I simply invited them to come to training. Ah. Great. Come to the training. Come see for yourself. Write your own story. Interview us. See what you say, um, and and uh, and and write about it. And one of the first media stories was me picking up a chair and uh, standing in front of a group of social workers, <laughs> trying to differentiate what acting out person is versus what release is. Ah. <laughs> and that seems like a pretty dramatic example. And uh, they, and how did they react to that? I mean, did, did they must have seen the conceptual difference pretty quickly? Yeah. And so here's me in the front page, of, you know, not front page, but on the <laughs> article here, holding a chair up, ready to throw it at somebody. But the differentiation was we really struggled in the beginning with what an acting out person was and what release was mm -hmm. and the emotional outburst. So. The big dramatic example was I pick up a chair and I throw it in the corner where nobody's standing, and I did that purposefully where I look at the corner and make sure nobody's there, and then I throw it. And then I pick, and then I pick up the chair and I go at somebody, and I'm ready to throw it at them. And, and, and the reason for the big dramatic show was it was really difficult for staff to, to find that an acting out person, a physical acting out episode, threat of harm to self or others, was more of this than it was of this. And sometimes our emotional outbursts, we can manage those differently, and be able to get the tension reduction a little bit sooner. Mm -hmm. And how? And how, what? Personally, how do you? What? What? What are the kind of the cues that you look for to differentiate the two? Say that again. What, what are the cues that you would look like to differentiate between uh, a violence being imminent, be the chair being, in other words, thrown in the corner, or being thrown at a person? So, so one of the things I've used is. Um, if a if a student throws the chair in a corner and it appears that they're you know yes they're damaging the chair or they're damaging property, um, but do you need to take them down? I don't use those words, but do you need to use physical restraints at this time? Do you need to then go? The student is now standing there huffing and puffing and very angry and probably still yelling. They threw the chair. Do you need to go over there now and put them in a, a two person restraint? And usually the, question, the answer to the question from staff is, well, no, I don't think I would do that. And then we talk about the risk, risk, risks of restraints. And if the answer is no, then where would you put them in the verbal escalation continuum? I see. And then okay, this would be release because intimidation is this, and well, this is release. And, and trying to draw the levels so they have a, you know, a, a, an anchor, if you will. Mm -hmm. Because those can be, especially when a situation's in play, those those can fluctuate. Those those seeming 
the difference between release and acting out. And, and really the only default for the real true knowledge of the staff member, at least in my humble opinion, would be, do you need to go put restraints? You know, do you need a team response? Do you need those things? And if you do, well, then I trust your instincts, and we have to trust. Now, as a, yeah. John, as a director of school safety and culture, I mean, i got to ask you, what are, are there elements that make up your dream school culture? And, and, you know, if there's something isn't there, what would be the most important thing to add? And, and what could you maybe live the most without? The, the, the dream culture is when we're keeping kids in school that are safe to be in school, that we're responding appropriately when and with the right resources, when we have threatening situations, when kids really show that they're unsafe to be in school, um, and having those resources available to us from either outside partners or gee, wish they would fund schools the right way, we would have those mental health resources available to us. Um, and so the staff to do that. In the interim, um, I keep giving staff the strategies that they need, that they need, not that we think they need, but they need, mm -hmm. to help them have a practice on how to move into these situations. I see. And who's your biggest inspiration in your professional life, John? Well, that's a tough one. Do you know that my mind went to Randy Boardman right away? Is that right? Uh, my mind went directly to Randy as um, as we've had so many conversations about how to do this in a school, and he's had the experience as a principal to actually do these mm -hmm. do these steps and take these actions, and to really have the attitude of teaching and helping come alongside staff to learn a practice mm -hmm. that's probably different than they've had before. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, I, I know that he'll appreciate that, and it is a... It is a, uh, a, a degree of participation that uh, has got to seem unique. Are there any last thoughts, John, that you'd like to add about our training or what's happening in U46 that uh, other school districts you think would be good to know? You know, Terry, um, what, what I just thought of and, and might be very important to know, when we initially started training in CPI, we did not have time to do restraint training. So you just... And so... Go ahead. You just worked with the verbal part of the course. You didn't do the physicals. So by accident, it ended up being the smartest thing that I think we've done. Huh. And, and that's because uh, people didn't have the alternative skills to take, well, I mean, I'm not going to say take people down, but to, to uh, physically restrain. Well, if you give someone a tool, I mean, they're going to use the tool. And then the other thing that um, we reflect on it, you know, and here's a here's a plug for our um, our chapter meetings. In one of our chapter meetings here in the Midwest region, we had really a, a great discussion. Um, Frederick Bryant at his organization, um, he he said that at his uh, and he works at um, probably one of the most difficult um, mental health organizations for you know clients that they're kind of at the end of the rope. Um, as far as resources, and he said in his organization, they're actually following that strategy too, where they're going to only have a core, um, a core group of responders, if you will, each shift that would respond to do the uh, nonviolent crisis intervention if it was required as a last resort. But in training everybody in it, they're not doing that anymore. Right. And what it what it did turn out for us is that uh, looking back. If I would have focused on restraints, or at least trained in restraints, mm -hmm. it, it, it's always the last thing you do, right? Well, it's supposed to be our last resort, yeah, always. Well, and then at the last day of the at the end of the training, it's right. usually one of the last things you do in Correct. training, oh, right? Cool. And if people only take ten percent away of, of training, what are they going to take away? Well, you know, that's something that we we uh, that's uh, we emphasize here all the time is that you know this is this is uh, nonviolent crisis intervention. I mean, the last it is only hands on is only meant to be the last resort, and that the non physicals are really the the, the crux of nonviolent crisis intervention. We, we we keep trying to emphasize that, but you're right. I mean, people will refer to us as the takedown class, and, and then uh, that, that causes a lot of gnashing of teeth around here. <laughs> I gotta tell yeah, you. And, and, and I remember that being, you know, back in um, my, uh, my, other, my other careers, that, you know, that was kind of what it was known as. And so just by accident of time, you know, of contracts and you only have this many hours to train, well, then we can only do this much, and so we're going to have to peel this out, and we're not going to be able to do this. 
So, so next school year is what we're going to be doing is having each principal develop a team and, and or not develop, assign a team. And then we're going to go train that team in the use of nonviolent crisis intervention. I see. So very uh, a more dedicated staff, a smaller a staff with maybe more retention and expertise than if you were doing a more general and large training. Right. So the training will still stand. The training day stands alone. Mm -hmm. um, it won't be restraints. And if you're part of that core at your school, we would go at CIs and then have a two to three hour session at another time. Um, reflect back on our lessons and reflect back on all the, you know, I, I don't have it quite clear in my mind and on every step, but we'd have some reflection. We'd put some verbal escalation continuum on the board um, and then and then train and restraints, you know, really focusing on last resort. Sounds good. All right. So I, I don't, there's lots of school districts that get caught up on doing the training for two days or a day and a half or the 12 hours. And I, I we do it in one day. We focus on, you know, uh, the lessons that are about, you know, verbals and nonverbals and um, and the de-escalation techniques. And then we, we don't, we do personal safety, but we don't do the restraints. Well, John, we certainly wish you continued success with the program. We're, we're, we're definitely delighted you joined us today on the podcast. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Great right. talking to you. Okay. My guest today on Unrestrained has been John Heiderscheidt. John is, John is the Director of Safety.